Hey everybody, it's P. Day Turner, executive producer and host of the Break It Down Show. Man, it is a great day today. I'm in lovely San Diego, standing on the beach, literally, of the Mission Bay Hilton, not a paid sponsor, recording on my Bulletproof podcast equipment. The rig is an H6 Zoom recorder and Shure SM35 microphones. Hey, so our guest today is Larry Sanger. Larry is all about freedom of data and expression. He's the co-founder of Wikipedia and, frankly, not that happy with the controlling siloed nature of the data on Wikipedia. So he's created a new thing called the Encyclosphere, and John and I sit down with him and talk about how he wants to de-silo encyclopedic data, very similar to the blogosphere, where you write something, someone writes an aggregator, they gather up all that data and create their own encyclopedia. This is how you unlock our data that we create and take it out of the hands of corporations like ABC, which is Google, Facebook, etc., Twitter. Now, of course, the charitable part, it's the end of the year. If you're into charitable giving, savethebrave.org. That's my recommendation. That is my charity. And you can easily go there by going to savethebrave.org and click on that Donate tab. And then you do a monthly or a one-time or do both. It would be great if you did. We can help us support these veterans that have supported most of us. Hey, one other thing real quick, too. Support the show. I mean, right now, I... I am so fortunate to have the show where it is, and it's growing, and it's growing because all of you do the things that you do. So you buy the shirts, you do the sharing, you, you connect with me, and people see these conversations, and they give the show a try. These things matter, and, uh, and, and really, I, I appreciate all of you so much for that. Hey, I'll, I'll be quiet now. Larry Sanger, here he comes. Enjoy. Lions Rock Productions. <laughs> This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this East. This is Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. This is Larry Sanger. You're listening to The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yeah, I've got Larry on the show today. He's been on several times, and Larry is a, a free speech advocate and also an advocate for our own personal data, and he's also someone who's looking at how we store, I, I guess, I'm going to take a stab at this, Larry, how, how we store mm-hmm. encyclopedic data and share it so that there's a more complete picture and there's more, basically, liberty and freedom in that approach. How did I do? Pretty good. Pretty okay. good. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of ways in. But yeah. Yeah. And of course, John is sitting in too. So I want to make sure. Well, actually, John, I'll just give you the first question and let you kind of fire us off. Well, okay. As someone who is advocating for a level playing field when it comes to the capturing of all that we create, and I've said this many times on the uh, show, so I'm going to ask for your correction, but I heard a statistic that is probably old enough that it's different now, but that if you took the entire body of human creation, from the dawn of time to 1974. We are creating that now every 12 days, I think. And so in order to maintain some sort of lack of structure so that we are all creating and not being filtered by some entity that will take on the responsibility and the power of regulating what is created and what is stored for posterity, I think that's really what you're an advocate of and and being an advocate of that. What are the big challenges that you run into all of the time when you have to explain to somebody that, hey, this really means something? I think at this point, I I would have answered the question very differently in like 2001, say. But in 2019, the challenge is really passivity. You know, the system that we have dominated as it is by um, big tech is the one that we're going to have to live with from now on. And um, and a lot of people just have never even really learned, especially younger people, I think, never really learned and fully appreciated that there is another way to organize the internet. Um, that the uh, it, It's pretty striking, actually, that just in 10 years, the internet has been completely flipped on its head. 10 years ago, you could still talk about people who were late getting online. And now pretty much everybody who's going to be online is online and has been for many years. They have formulated their idea about what the internet is all about, right? And a lot of those people 
never really understood. Maybe they were, weren't online when the internet was different, basically, and how they never really understood the whole idea of decentralized networks, of owning your own data, of having open protocols, basically. And uh, I can explain any of that if you want. The, the, real, the real problem is getting people to understand that there are that the issues of freedom and privacy that they care about are actually very intimately bound up with these other issues of, again, owning your own data and using open protocols and so forth. So as we move forward, I mean, now is the time to nip this activity in the bud or to set us on the right course. And I appreciate you taking on that responsibility. Who are your allies in this fight? Hey, this is P. Dave Turner from the Break It Down Show, checking in real quick to ask you this. John, Scott, and I all support Save the Brave with our time, our location, our effort, and our money. Each month, we give a small amount. Do the same with us. Go to savethebrave.org, click on the Donate tab, pick an amount that you want to come out each month, and they will handle all the rest. I stand behind these folks. Thank you so much. Let's get back to the show. As we move forward, I mean, now is the time to nip this activity in the bud or to set us on the right course. And I appreciate you taking on that responsibility. Who are your allies in this fight? Um, well, actually, it's interesting. Whoever is basically most pissed off at Facebook and Twitter tend to be the people who gravitate to the Knowledge Standards Foundation to the, the idea of an encyclopedia network. Yeah, there's a lot of people, those a lot of those people out there. And basically, you just need to, to explain what a different system would look like, and they get pretty excited. And of course, I'm finding that something like 80% of the people who are interested in the Knowledge Standards Foundation are developers. And this isn't surprising to me, uh, because programmers are the ones who understand these issues because you know they they know essentially how the digital network sausage is made they understand that if basically you design a system to be open then it can't be shut down and if you it, it can't be dominated by any one player and if you design a system that is closed that inevitably it's going to be abused. So basically, it tends to be older developers. So a lot of middle-aged guys, actually. Okay, boomer. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, <laughs> I'm not old enough to be a boomer. Yeah, I'm told that doesn't matter. That's the best thing about this <laughs> oh, uh, put down. <laughs> oh, okay. Fantastic. Yeah, us Gen X guys, right? We're trying to figure these things out. So I was having an interesting conversation with some folks that are trying to figure out blockchain. And the group is called Blockchain for, for Good. And they wanted to establish the ethics of blockchain, but ethics don't cooperate like that. You know, what you think is ethical mm -hmm. today may be horribly unethical tomorrow or in context or in application. What is it about your experience, you know, 20, 25, 30, 40 years into this game that's required to, to get that open nature to be comfortable and actually the path that, that you're seeking? Why do you have to be middle-aged to understand <laughs> This, uh, this problem. What maybe another way to put the question is what did I learn back yes. in the 1990s? Yes. I just had an immediate experience of interacting with people via like Usenet, for example, a good example of, of a decentralized network. You could use lots of different news reader software. You weren't stuck with any one particular news reader. And it was well understood that the groups, you know, anybody could start a group. There was no central management of the whole Usenet system. Not until Google took it over, of course, That's that was kind of lame. But yeah, I, I mean, back in the 90s, when you interacted with people, you it was implicitly understood that it, it was either one-on-one, -on -one, as in email, or like a private IRC chat, or it was out in open, as in Usenet, and in a lot of list serves to a certain extent, mailing lists, in other words, which use email. And the nice thing about this is that that you didn't have to ask for permission from anyone. That, is, that was just understood. The development of the tools, they, it was all done by basically volunteers. Um, 
volunteer developers and the developers were motivated, I think, partly, you know, just to advance their careers, but partly because, you know, um, there's a great deal of honor to be gotten among um, programmers. Um, you know, if, if you can brag that you actually are the author of this tool that everybody uses, that's a big feather in your cap. And that's, that's how it worked. So, I mean, I'm just sort of, you ask, what was it that we learned back in the 1990s? When I say this, it all sounds kind of like, Sounds kind of boring, doesn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> but ultimately, the 2019 re-implementation of this stuff isn't going to be that boring because the technologies are so much more interesting, mm. right? We're not just talking about email and mailing lists and Usenet news groups and you know the basic pre-JavaScript web, right? We're talking about all kinds of stuff. We're talking about a replacement for Wikipedia or something that would, can include Wikipedia that enables a lot of other people to, to participate in. We're talking about um, completely decentralized social media systems. Um, so, and we're, we're sort of figuring that out. There's a lot of different players that are figuring out exactly how to do that now. Gab, for example, has... Uh, moved to the Mastodon network. BitChute has attempting to have a fully decentralized video hosting platform, which is pretty interesting, actually. Those are things that, that we would barely have been able to conceive of back in the 1990s. But the principles ultimately should be the same. So the passivity that you were talking about earlier, this is a big problem. I mean, we agree that Twitter is a place full of poisonous comments and, and, and thoughts. You're not on Twitter anymore. No, oh, I am. I'm, I'm not on Facebook anymore. Oh, you're not on Facebook anymore. My, my apologies, my correction. Yeah. So, but it's a place that's hard to, you know, like I put up a show and someone may jump in without ever listening to the show or commenting, and all they have is something horrible to say, you know, call yeah. someone a name, whatever. Yet yeah, that is the place we continue to go. What is a thing, a site like Gab or Mastodon, how do they build a big enough crowd so that the big players, the people that put things out, want to be there in the first place? Yeah, that's a, that's a hard question, especially since there are so many people now who know the attractions of uh, really big networks, right? So we understand how neat it can be to have like a, few hundred friends and old high school friends and whatever contacting you out of the blue, trying to organize people to create such networks out of the de novo, basically from nothing is difficult. A lot of the people who participate on Mastodon, for example, are they tend to be techies of one sort or another. And then the people who go to Gab are people who are really, really upset at the censorship that goes on, on especially Twitter. But that's not enough to, to actually organize a whole community around. I mean, the problem that we're trying to solve, I think, wasn't solved back in the 1980s and 90s when these sorts of project, these sorts of, of um, networks came into being in the first place, because, you know, they didn't have to compete with the likes of uh, uh, Facebook or Twitter. So I'm not I'm not 100% sure how we're going to get there. I mean, I think I think ultimately we're going to have to create a sort of artificial movement, a deliberate movement is a better word to put it. Like last summer, right in June and July, I organized the social media strike, right? I think you might have interviewed me around yes, that for time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, you know, that was a good way to do it. And I didn't even try to get that much. I didn't try to get that much momentum for it, a lot of publicity or anything. But nevertheless, we did get dozens of articles just like without any significant. We didn't even do a press release, I think. At least I think we didn't. Anyway, there's very little anyway in the way of actually chasing down press. We could do that now, though. And then I can easily imagine how we could have like a new tryout day or something. I talked about that last summer. We, we never did do it because I never had time. I'm too busy with now 
the Encyclosphere project. Right. So tell us about Encyclosphere then. Give us, I mean, we've kind of covered some background stuff and a lot of it's going to be what you talk about now, but talk about Encyclosphere and, and, and why it's important. Okay. So the problem about information online in general, not only uh, communication, but like news, um, communication among people and news, it's all centrally controlled. It's all in the hands of uh, these giant corporations that have their interests, not yours, at heart. And it turns out that Wikipedia is it has become another instance of the same. It would be wonderful, I think, if the world could go to a single place and get all the different points of view fairly represented and so forth. That was the vision that we had for Wikipedia um, back in the day. And in the first five to 10 years, Wikipedia made a reasonably credible effort at doing that. But especially, especially in the last few years, it's just gotten worse and worse in terms of the ability to um, get dissenting voices heard in, in the Wikipedia community. I think we can do a lot better. I think that uh, we could have, instead of on the order of um, five, six million articles in Wikipedia, there could be hundreds of millions in the English Wikipedia. And uh, instead of having one article, which attempts, fails lately, um, at representing all points of view fairly, you just actually have different articles written from different points of view, and then rate them. But of course, in order for that to work, you have to, you can't have a single website to do it. Whenever there's a single website, there's going to be a single management, there's going to be single editorial control. So what there has to be is a network, um, an old fashioned internet network. So there is no one in control. And the way that, that uh, articles are shared online is a lot like um, the way that articles, uh, blog posts are shared uh, via the blogosphere. How via these protocols or standards um, called RSS, really simple syndication, or the Atom standard, and these enable bloggers to just share their blogs uh, out into the ether of the of the internet, and and anybody can pick them up and read them um, using any sort of blog reader they want. And it's a, it's a pretty cool system. A lot of those a lot of aspects of the system they're still very well supported. And you can still use it in the same way that you did in in 2005 when it was new, but yeah, it doesn't really matter that it's that that it's not used in that way so much anymore. The principles are still in use, and this is why there isn't any single dominant blogging reader or farm out there. You've got all kinds. You've got like WordPress and Blogger and Medium and Blogspot various others. That's the way it should be. So we think that there should be an encyclosphere where there is a blogosphere, there should be an encyclosphere. So when Wikipedia publishes its articles, it shouldn't do that just via its website. It should put them out there on, in a feed, basically. And then at the same time, other media wiki encyclopedias like Ballotpedia, for example, mm -hmm. and Oh, there's a lot, right? They also could use the same sort of uh, plugin for MediaWiki, that's the software, and publish feeds. And then you can imagine um, these things called aggregators scooping up all of those feeds from all the different encyclopedias and putting them all together into one giant, my original word for it was greater wiki, right? So it's a, it, it, it is the superset of all the encyclopedias in the world. We could have ratings for all of the articles. The ratings themselves could be syndicated in the same way using uh, similar sorts of standards. Then people could create where there are blog readers, there would be encyclopedia readers, right? So basically, we're in the process of, of developing the Encyclosphere on the, the volunteer-only Knowledge Standards Foundation, which we just got started. We've got over 800 people on the mailing list just as of the last few weeks. We have several dozen, I guess it's actually up to over 80 
people on the Slack channel, well over a dozen, maybe a couple of dozen people just discussing things and working on different things. The actual standards for encyclopedias are now under development. I have talked to people, you know, sort of asking them to start working on scrapers and plugins for for things like uh, Wikipedia and, and whatnot, so that that um, a feed can be output and then people can build apps around around them. So, so uh, let me just leave my introduction with this little thought. Open up an app or go to a website and type in a search like, I don't know, jihad. Instead of getting one single article about jihad from Wikipedia, you actually have a few dozen articles. And then imagine that um, there was a, a default ranking according to various ratings, but you could very quickly and easily change that so that you could look at the, what the ranking is of those articles among Muslim imams or the, ra the rating among you know, American liberals or American conservatives or whatever you like. It'd be very interesting to see and compare the top rated articles according to the different groups. I think it'd actually be extremely enlightening. And I think that if this app came into existence, then uh, that would make it possible for people to leap to the top of the rankings simply by writing a better article that is, that is um, more highly rated according to some prominent subset of the rating public. So, and that that means a, a knowledge competition, the likes of which we've never seen. Think, uh, that makes me excited. Yeah. That does sound exciting, Larry. But do you think there's a danger in somebody being able to manipulate confirmation bias to uh, earn a better ranking and, and then dominate rankings? And how long do you think a curve like that lasts? Because I think we're living in a curve somewhat like that in a lot of ways. I think we're going to make it out of the other side, but how, what do you think is the curve for that? Well, first, let me try to understand what the uh, objection or the question is. So, so um, you're worried about people, what gaming the system somehow, or yeah, um, and you know we're speaking in hypotheticals here. So, I just want to get your thoughts on whether or not there is a danger in someone yeah. saying, you know, for instance, someone, yeah, um, yeah fifteen years ago might have said, you know, I, I have really conservative points of view. I wish there were a media outlet out there that would that would tell my side of the story a little more often. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. we have Fox News. Whatever your thoughts are on Fox News, yeah. uh, some people would say, boy, have they taken it to an extreme? How, uh, how do you feel about somebody saying, hey, you know what? I can just go look at all of the, you know, I can prioritize all of the articles out there by the ones that confirm yeah. my bias and then uh, shut everybody else out. Is there a danger there? And, and how long do you think that danger is? Because I, mm -hmm. I think that if there is one, there's a duration before we get past it. And that's my, my hopeful. Just having the network, first of all, there's lots of things to say about this. Um, just having the network available does not constrain how apps are written. So you can imagine apps written so that the user has no choice but to see a wide variety of different articles from different points of view. And who knows, maybe the, the features of, of uh, such an app will end up being so great that, that that's the one that everyone uses. Um, it's also possible that there will end up being like a conservapedia and a liberalpedia, and these different competing resources become essentially their own walled gardens, except that's the thing. That's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because you can't call an open network a walled garden. You can't call a subset of an open network a walled garden. You can select from it, but that's also true of the internet in general, right? So the mere having of tags that we could use to describe ourselves doesn't constrain us in how we use the resource or what sorts of, of apps are created for us. I can tell you how I would design a reader app if I ever wanted to do that. I don't know if I ever will. I probably shouldn't because that would then be regarded as like the official Encyclosphere app, which 
well, there never should be such a thing. But at any rate, I can give you some ideas. I mean, I would do that. I would, I would, as I was saying before, I, I would, I, I wouldn't force people to consider lots of different points of view, but I would nudge them to do so. The thing is also, right, that's not how it is now. If you go to YouTube, for example, YouTube is so concerned that you are not that you're being exposed to other points of view on a subject that for some articles, they will put a little notice at the bottom and, and say, this uh, video was created by such and such. And here's the Wikipedia article about, or I think another sort of notice basically just links to the Wikipedia article about the subject as sort of essential background reading, because, you know, this, the, the fool who is um, talking on the video um, might not know what he's talking about. You see, this is different because what we're talking about here is an open network that makes it unusually easy to find different competing points of view. There's going to be pressures. There will be pressures on people to, among those who are trying to control the narrative, to continue to do so. And, and um, those who never want to consider any other alternative point of view, um, those people will go out of their way to avoid competing points of view. Absolutely. I don't see how we can solve that problem. We're actually, the point is that they'll have to go out of their way. Yeah. I, well, I, the point is that other points of view will be more easily available now. Right. Right? Okay. So when you have these competing points of view, people's feelings tend to get hurt, at least these days. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> right. Liberty is not just about my liberty and what I want to do. It's what Larry wants to do. It's what John wants to do. And my ability to let you guys, you know, obviously within reason, but for the most part, let you do whatever it is that you want to do or say. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Liberty is not just about my liberty and what I want to do. It's what Larry wants to do. It's what John wants to do. And my ability to let you guys, you know, obviously within reason, but for the most part, let you do whatever it is that you want to do or say. Yeah. How do we develop more of that capacity socially? I mean, it's great to have this tool that comes out, but if people are wanting to shoot each other in the face because they can't take it, you know, so much for the tool. We certainly have been doing something wrong with our kids um, in the last uh, 10 or 20 years with so many um of recent generations basically coming to graduating from high school, essentially not wanting to offend anyone and being much too easily offended. It's actually the first one that bothered me. I, I actually, when I stopped teaching in 2005, I was actually starting to see some of this. It's like people were a little too nice. They were not engaging with each other you know, in the sort of robust way. It doesn't have to be rude or anything, but it has to be, it has to be pointed and robust, um, and, and they weren't, and that bothered me. I think there's a few things that we could try to change. One is to get rid of this notion of, of uh, every point of view is valid, uh, you know, equally valid, and that, you know, that basically relativism it, unless you unless you have one of the the disapproved points of view, in which case you know your relativism apparently doesn't apply. But all, all the others are. It's like um, you know, it's just a matter of it's just a matter of taste, and it's so easy for philosophers. Most most PhD philosophers are just disgusted with this tendency of their introductory students, intro philosophy students to fall back into this really lazy-minded relativism. It's so easy to refute. I think that that would help a lot because then, you know, then you can't just say, oh, well, you know, so-and-so has a different point of view from mine, but I guess that's okay because everybody has his own point of view. They're all equally valid. No, you don't want to say that. No, there is a truth about things. It's really important that we get it right. That actually makes the existence of a 
uh, of uh, disagreement more noteworthy. And um, so that's one thing. And then, of course, then the, the other thing is that um, for whatever reason, you know, people do tend to regard, they regard, uh, regard disagreements as, as insults, basically, especially when it's something that, that they can't just say, well, that's just a different point of view about and I, I think that ultimately comes down to the, politiz the politicization of, of uh, education. I think basically the left has taken over um, education at all levels. Um, and they, they have, uh, to a certain extent, to a very great extent, actually, made certain points of view unthinkable, unspeakable. That's one of the biggest problems, actually. And obviously, that that makes it difficult for us to um, to debate those. So, on the one hand, you've got this relativism that we've been living with actually for many decades now, probably since the '60s. And on the other hand, more recently, we we have been dealing with this absolutism about certain issues, right? So, yeah. absolutism on one side, this incurious relativism on the other side for, for issues that are optional, no room for debate on either for either kind of issue. So my, my view is entirely different. And this is like how I teach my boys. I, I homeschool my two children. Also how I always taught my philosophy students as well. It's um, everything is, is uh, up for grabs. Basically, you have to justify all of your views even the ones that everyone agrees with, uh, rationality is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want our listeners to know that you taught philosophy at Ohio State, at the Ohio State University. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Number one team in football <laughs> lately. Mm -hmm. I usually okay, don't care. But when they're number one, I start caring. Sure. Yeah. That's, uh, that's true for many of us. You know, my... Um, my cousin Dan went to Ohio State. He would have wanted that uh, whole exchange to have been published so good. There you go, Dan. Teaching this philosophy, it's similar to many that we've heard uh, recently from guys like Jordan Peterson uh, and, and Brett Weinstein. And, and I certainly agree with you. I mean, politically speaking, and the educational prohibition that uh, has come onto certain subjects is one that we definitely want to avoid. But I think that as much as that sounds like a doomsday, you know, a doomsday point of view, it's not. It's the opposite. It's an optimistic point of view. It's to say that humanity and our society, and we can take it. Like Pete said, it requires <laughs> a thick skin. And it sounds to me like you have some optimism about where we go from here. Well, I'm cautiously optimistic. Let's put it that way. I see a lot of pushback lately, not just from my conservative friends, but also from my liberal ones, not so much progressives. Progressives have basically stopped talking to me on Twitter. <laughs> it's like, I, I just don't hear from them anymore, period. And But uh, everyone else is, is uh, started, uh, starting to push back against orthodoxy, I guess. That's a good sign that the fact, indeed, that that Jordan Peterson, I like Jordan, Jordan Peterson quite a bit. The fact that uh, a lot of people have, have been responding positively to him and what he's doing is, for the most part, just philosophy. I think that's also a, a very good sign. There's so much to do, obviously, because, you know, those of us who believe in free speech and an open society, free thought of various kinds on different subjects. Those of us who, who instinctively hate the idea of hate speech or laws against hate speech, for example, we are right now decidedly in the minority, or at least in the minority of allowed voices on campuses. And that bothers me a lot. And I'm not really sure if we're making a lot of headway in battling that. Ultimately, I, I think that what it's going to take to actually change that part of Western culture is a massive shock to the system, such as we might be seeing in the form of Donald Trump and, and um, the unmasking of media, which are increasingly just looking like a 
propaganda organs. I mean, maybe it will, uh, it'll be a shock to the system that does it, but maybe it will be just people, um, individuals taking matters into their own hands, like, well, my family has been doing. So we don't want to have to even think about what um, you know our children are going to be taught in school or how well they're going to be taught, whether they're going to be you know, allowed to, to have their own independent thoughts and so forth. Um, no, we homeschool, right? And um, there's a lot of people out there who, who feel the same way, um, who would like to do it even if, even if they can't, and they do uh, what's called after-schooling, and uh, take some responsibility, increasing amounts of responsibility for their children. I've seen a number of comments along these lines lately that, that the way that the Gen Xers now who are you know teaching their now school-aged kids um, um, or, or college age, whatever the case might be, it's different. We invest more in our kids and we're hopefully the generation that is now coming up, not the millennials. Millennials were raised by the baby boomers. But the next one after that, the word is that that they tend to be a little more conservative than previous younger generations, and that they are just more free thinking, more interested in considering illicit thoughts. So I hope so. <laughs> you use the word illicit. <laughs> but in its, you know, in its purest definition, I think it's an interesting world that you describe. I think right now, though, the folks like you who are very deliberately homeschooling for that purpose are still outliers. Yeah, I suppose you're right. The pendulum as it swings, you know, I'm interested in tightening that pendulum swing so that it swings more frequently and faster. <laughs> And maybe not so far to the extremes, but allows for the exploration that happens with faster swings. How do you think of the process of turning you know, your method and your approach to educating your kids to something that is more widely done? Uh -huh. environment? Well, I can give you another specific idea that I've been kind of champing at that bit to work on. I don't know if I ever will. I think I probably will. I wouldn't want to go to school. I wouldn't want to go to college these days myself. I wouldn't want to go to, to almost anywhere. I certainly wouldn't want to go to my alma mater, Reed College, because uh, I know that I would be indoctrinated even more than I was from 1986 to 1991. Similarly, I don't want my sons to go to a lot of those sorts of colleges. I'm inclined to actually to try to start a movement to get people to uh, study independently together, like I can imagine the following thing, and I've written about this on my blog. I just keep coming back to this idea. I've been thinking about this since, since the 1990s, since I was a grad student myself. Just imagine a group of college students, college aid kids, college aged kids, and, and um, they all rent a big house, you know, it's got like half a dozen rooms and, and um, they each pay $500 a month and um, they hire a, a few grad students who come and hang out for a few hours every day to do different things, mostly what would be called uh, academic advising and maybe looking over papers and, and whatnot and giving feedback and then basically motivating them to study on their own. So those same students could attend lectures if they want to look at live lectures, or they could look at recorded lectures here and there. And then who knows, they, they could uh, organize themselves into different sorts of study groups. I think face-to-face -face is really important. And also, uh, they could go and have tutorials. They could just pay, I'm sure, a significant portion, possibly as many as half, of faculty members would be happy to accept a certain amount of money from people not affiliated with the university to who, who are undergoing this sort of like independent study thing. And then just imagine um, that th that information, information about the um, about a course of study is, is actually managed by a sort of registrar service 
and a uh, somebody that you had been studying with, whether that grad student or a professor um, who's acting as a tutor, can uh, say, okay, yes, so and so studied this these subjects um, from this time to that time, and did the equivalent of an A or a B or whatever, um, and and. Uh, basically compile information in this way. So there's different things that that a startup could do to make that possible and, and more attractive. And there have been a few startups that have done somewhat similar things, but they've been a little bit too regimented. So they've basically just become new kinds of universities. Maybe that is actually what's necessary. But I actually think that that um, going back to the old medieval system of education would could have a really big impact. So to get back to your question, if you have even a relatively small minority of people studying in this way and then speaking out about how they have studied the whole phenomenon, the whole idea of independent learning, and here I don't mean necessarily studying all on your own as an independent scholar, but independent of universities, independently managed, managed by yourself and with the help of maybe a few professionals. That idea will get out there. And I think that is another thing that that uh, could happen. I think eventually will happen. I might make it happen. So we'll see. You know what makes that happen, though, more so than one of us or several of us trying to create that environment or perpetuate the advancement of that environment is that somebody uh, with that style of education becomes enormously successful. No, you're right about that. That's really all we need is for some titan of industry to say, well, of course I'm dominating this industry. Here's how I was, you know, here's how I developed myself Yeah. uh, and how everybody else should. And then that's how the bandwagon is created. Right. Well, I mean, we're already getting some of those effects just just by um, the, all of the success stories about about uh, homeschooled college students and early startup people. I, any number of startup people. I can't give you any examples because there's just a lot of little ones out there. You know. Well, look at look at Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg. All they had to do was drop out of Harvard. Yeah. <laughs> or so it seems. Yeah. In so far, I'm not. I see. I don't know how good of an education those guys got, right? They they uh, started learning presumably something about uh, about their fields, you know, tech and, and entrepreneurship when they left college. I think a better example would be would be somebody who actually did get a substantive education and used it. So. Yeah. Again, I think there's some some startup people who have been homeschooled. Yeah, it's interesting. You were talking earlier, and it seemed like you were referring to your influence in like how you've got to be careful on what projects you take on or, or what you attach your name to because, you know, of, of the whole Wikipedia impact. Can you talk a little bit more about how that does impact what projects you pursue? Because putting your name and attaching your your influence to something definitely has an impact. Oh, well, thank you for saying that. I, I don't know how much of an impact it has, but the reason that I care about that is is not because I think my name has an impact. It's that, that I don't want to water down whatever reputation I have. And I, I also think that, that um, business can be a, a force for bad as well as good. (laughs) And I want to be on the side of the good, basically. So the question is, how do I decide? Yeah, yeah. Like, how do you weigh that out on your personal scale? Yeah. Right now, for example, I'm I'm, I'm going to start looking for new gigs. And, you know, there have been people who've been after me in the last, actually a lot in the last couple of years. And I've been offered literally dozens and dozens of times to to be uh, an advisor for different blockchain um, companies, and I accepted twice. I just have to start talking about ethics, right? Because right. uh, that's all it really comes down to. It's like I I don't want to represent myself as an expert in something, which it seems I it seems I would have to do that. Someone wanted me to to be an advisor. Um, this is a long time ago, but uh, about startup about pharmaceuticals. I was like, 
why on earth do you want me to be an advisor for a pharmaceutical company? That doesn't even make sense. I have enough money. <laughs> uh, I'm not rich at all. I'm middle class. I live more or less paycheck to paycheck. At least I don't have a lot of cushion, but I'm, I'm not worried. I, I'm very grateful to be able to say that I'm not worried. And that is absolutely fine with me. Being able to wake up in the morning and not have to worry about whether I've done something wrong by joining some sort of shady organization. You can't put a price on that, right? So the, the real answer to your question ultimately is, you know, why should you be honest? Well, actually, I actually answered that question, by the way, why be moral? I have a, I have a blog post up. It's recent too. So go to LarrySanger.org and uh, yeah, just scroll down. And uh, right now it is it's about like number eight. Yeah. I mean, beyond Beyond that, I mean, if if you're if you're asking like, how do I decide what you know who to work with or what to put my reputation behind? It's, it has to be something that I am have some expertise expertise in. Um, it also, has to be uh, I, I have to be really convinced that the people who are behind it are both intelligent and competent so that they can actually um, successfully carry off the idea. But uh, maybe more importantly than that even is that uh, I think the idea is one worth pursuing, basically. So like I, I turned down jobs with, uh, with um, Jason Calcanis twice, and I don't know why he was after me um, so, so much exactly, but I was working on other things at the time, and you know the opportunities that he were he, he was offering were were not as um, they didn't seem to be as important for purposes of of uh, changing the world for the better. Basically, that's what it's all about. Uh, I mean, there isn't anything else. <laughs> right. Yeah, changing the world for the better. Well, I want to tell our listeners, LarrySanger.org, there's so much more there than article number eight. There's a ton of reading material. You guys should go through it. There's a lot there to uh, to see, including a much more thorough and complete explanation of the encyclosphere and right. how it all works and why it's important. It's always interesting talking to you, Larry, because you're part philosopher, you're part Wikipedia founder. You know, this is... This is an incredible opportunity to see and hear from you on how you how you see the world playing out. Uh, I, I think our generation is sort of, if we're going to be unfair, the boomers came up and they did all the hippie stuff and, and, and then they raised shitty ex-hippie kids and, you know, they're <laughs> all butter oh, all the time. Come on, be nice. Yeah, I, I, like I, said, I was being unfair there. there. <laughs> but yeah. the Gen X folks, we've sort of just kind of been like, well, whatever, we're just going to work on our stuff. And I was locked out of my house every day when my mom and dad had to go work. You know, so I was a latchkey kid. That's the Gen X story, basically. Yeah, well, me too. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and when you are left up to your own devices, you find out new things and you discover stuff and you read Kant in your spare time because there's nothing else you can do. <laughs> And you end up you end up starting a, a world famous uh, you know internet encyclopedia and and I I love this and the thing I wanted to say is as I tell all these stories and we create all these things having a resource to learn about whatever president it is or whatever historical thing it is and giving all those authors a slightly you know it allows you to de silo all that great work into something that really can give you a better idea of who Julius Caesar was or what IBM is or, you know, any topic you can have a multitude of variety of perspectives and get truly a better sense because it turns out one person can't capture everything about something. Right. No, absolutely. No, I mean, I've always been a huge fan of, of uh, collaboration. And I think that uh, it is very possible that the top ranked articles in the future in Cyclosphere uh, rankings will almost always be collaboratively written articles, but it will be different groups of collaborators. Um, and uh, no, I mean, the, the, look, I, we, we hugely appreciate having all of this information at our fingertips, but I don't think we realize what we're missing out on when that information is not really up to snuff 
that it, it isn't as well written or as well sourced or as credible as it might be. And I think that that when we actually are able to surface what has a reasonable claim to be the best explanation of a certain topic, according to the experts on the, on the subject, or according to 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 some algorithmically determined neutral uh, article, I think we're going to see what we have been missing out on with Wikipedia. It's a lot, a lot, and not just not just in terms of quality, but also in terms of quantity. So one thing that the that the young guys at that Everpedia sort of turned me on to, which I didn't really realize before I just started thinking about it a lot and working with them on it is just the idea that there could be encyclopedia articles about a hell of a lot more things than, than there are out there now. Like uh, I, my desktop background happens to have a bunch of sailboats on it. I can imagine people writing pages, encyclopedia articles. They might not write any other kinds of articles about their stuff, but to catalog, to as, as a way of just saving the information out there, I can imagine millions of articles about sailboats out there. And it's just one of the, one of the things that people do. And if there's, a, I mean, the information on some obscure sail, sailboat might be worthless. We'll see. I, I guess there will, there will be studies done to see how, how good the information about obscure topics is. If it's available and out there, it might turn out to be make life even easier, I suppose, yeah. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Well, I think uh, our guest today has been Larry Sanger. And Larry, we thank you not only for coming on the show and expressing your point of view, but I think in large part articulating a good chunk of ours as well, because I think your advantage at this moment in time is that you have a great firm grasp of what has happened with technology, uh, historically speaking, with a very sharp eye on the future of what can uh, happen so that we maximize the potential of uh, what we're capable of doing and what we're capable of capturing. And, uh, and we really appreciate that and we appreciate your optimism and we appreciate your, uh, your willingness to share it with you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you.